lakini sasa kama hakuna heshima kuna vyote hivi e, yote yanatokea na hiyo ndio maana mwingine akisimamia msimamo wake wanasema hatutakupa pesa naona na tutakupa pesa wanaona kwamba hiyo ndio silaha na hatutakupa pesa kuna jamaa mmoja anasema kwamba alikuwa nilikuwa namsikiliza anasema kwamba e, unaposafiri unaenda Ulaya ni saa sawa unachukua kikombe unaanza e, kukamua e, e, unakamua e, linyama ile kubwa ile elephant eh unalikamua hiyo unaona una, unaweza kukamua kweli wewe alafu wanapokuja huku yani anaandikia hapo hapo kama ni vizu napewa hapo hapo na sisi wakati mwingine hata sisi wa Afrika kwa Afrika sema ni ngoja niende niende labda inchi fulani hey. na sisi tunaanza ku kuchukua msimamo ule ule wa Ulaya wapi tunaweka pale na matokeo yake tuangalie hata vile vile sisi katika mfumo wetu wa maisha hatupo kama kule mfumo wetu wa maisha tuna, ni, ni, ni mfumo shirikishi ambapo tunaongea na tunapoongea katika kuongea huko na kushirikishana ni uponyaji is a healing lakini kuli kujifungia kunatengeneza e, tunachosema kwamba ni psychological problems tunapata ma psychologists wengi ambao wana be employed kwa ajili ya kututibu na tunakoelekea ndio huko ndio huko kwa sababu ya e, tunasema tuko katika modern world tunasahau tulivyo sisi na kwa sababu hiyo kitabu hiki kitusaidie sisi kwa ajili ya ku reform our minds e, ni kwa ajili ya self awareness na ili tuweze kufanya hivi tunahitaji sana kwa wanyenyekevu mnyenyekevu sio yule anayepiga magoti mbele ya mwenzake mnyenyekevu ndio yule anaye sema mimi di, ni binadamu nipo tayari kusikiliza wenzangu ananiambia nini na nipo tayari kufuata ushauri wao wa, wa, unisaidie mimi kukua kiakili kibinadamu na vile vile hata kiroho ili niweze kuwa mwema kuliko tuwe na magonjwa ya akili ambayo yamekuja mengi sana tunasema afya ya akili ni hiyo ndio maana kwa mfano unasema kwamba wewe unatembea tembea huko ovyo ovyo tu alafu watu wanakucheka ndio unafurahi wakikucheka unahitaji kwenda hospitali unaumwa una, 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 una ugonjwa wa akili unahitaji tiba kwa hiyo e, ndio maana anasema kwamba turudi tena kwenye roots zetu tuangalie tulikotoka tuangalie tulipo ushirikiano wetu kwa pamoja tunaweza na ushirikiano utatufanya tuweze kufanya vizuri na elimu tunayoipata tunajua kwamba nayo imeathiriwa ndio maana leo hii tuna, tunaogopa kwenda kukaa kwenye kwenye kiti kusoma hivi tunataka tufanyiwe wewe pata picha wewe ni daktari Unaso, unasomewa unafanyiwa kila kitu utafanya operation kwa mtu sunaua badala ya kuoperate kichwa na operate miguu yote haya ni, ni, ni effect ya kusema kwamba sasa sasa elimu yetu tunataka tuitwe doctor lakini hatujafanyia kazi tunataka tuitwe professor tujafanyia kazi usiwe tu wamemtunukia ndio tunachotaka hicho hakita tusaidia katika maisha yetu kwa hiyo ndio maana tunapoona kitu kama hiki kile mfano sasa kitusaidie sisi kwenda ndani zaidi kuangalia elimu yetu malezi yetu ili kwa waafrika sisi ni wafanya kazi ni wachapa kazi eh lakini leo yetu tunapenda kulelewa matokeo yake ya kulelewa hayo tunataka yani watupe pesa yule anayetupa pesa naona kwa madiru rafiki kumbe tunakuwa watumwa bado na ndio maana hata ndoa zetu zidumu vijana wengi wanataka kulelewa naolewa na mwanamke ambaye ana pesa Mwa, mwana mwanamke anatafuta pesa tunaogopa kazi sasa hizi tumepata wapi hayo yote mbona si ya kwetu sio mambo yetu hayo hizo tunayapata wapi haya kwa hiyo tunahitaji sasa kukaa chini kukaa chini kuangalia yote hayo kwa hiyo malezi yetu tuangalie mila yetu ambayo ni muhimu sana leo hii 
tunaongelea e, mambo ya mmonyoko wa maadili waafrika kwa asili ni wapenda uhai lakini sasa propaganda za nje zimetujia hapa eh kwa sababu tuna pesa eh tunapewa ta pesa kutoa mimba unaotoaji wa mimba mwingi sasa ameokotwa mtoto pale ameokotwa si yule atataki tena watoto leo atataka atakuzaa sisi siku hizi kwa nini sasa ni kwa sababu ya hiyo hiyo trend yani wakiniona mimi hata hata, hata wakati fulani nataka kubadilia tangoze ni kwa mweusi tu nataka niwe mweupe na wakati fulani ukimeza hivyo vidonge alafu kasimama unakuwa kama sanamu so hiyo ni kama kuweke kwenye mizumu mule yani wewe umemeza kile kidonge chako kimekuchubua kiasi kwamba ukiangalia mishipa ya, da, ya damu ile inaonekana imesimama hii tunajidhalilisha sana kwa sababu ya mambo ambayo ya kuiga nje kwa hiyo tunapoongelea mambo ya African independence katika mambo ya uchumi e, kama tulivyo tunavyosoma katika kitabu hiki tuongelee sasa haya yote yanaingira hapo mila yanaongelea mambo ya elimu yanaongelea mambo ya malezi yetu yanaongelea lifestyle yetu tuweze kurudi nyuma kuangalia kwamba tunakoelekea sio tu, turudi tuweze kufanya inavyotakiwa kwa hiyo kwa niamba ya e, ya, 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 ya mgeni rasmi mwasho baba askofu mkuu niko na maana machache tu hayo na zaidi zaidi kumpongeza sana profesa malango e, ningekuwa nafahamu kiruga chenu kule ningesema <laughs> eh kuna 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 hicho kichewa bwana wanaongea kichewa hicho eh hiyo kwa mbili kwa mbili Eh? Eh. Hey. Asante sana. Mungu akubariki, akuongoze katika kazi yako na uendelee kuandika tena hatua nyingine. Mtu wa nje ameweza kuona hiyo na ni hazina. Sisi wa ndani pengine tuoni hazina kwa sababu ya dharau yetu. Wakati fulani ya kudharauliana atuoni atu, atu za hazina hiyo. Hazina iliyofichika mtu wa nje ameiweza kuipata na ameifukua eh basi tuweze kuchukua eh, njia hiyo na kuweza kuelewa na kuweza kufanya inavyotakiwa asante sana kwa kunisikiliza another round of applause for our guest of honor Thank you so much your lordship Stephen Msomba for the for the message truly uh, he gave us uh, he was just giving us the backbone of this uh, when we talk about economic slavery yeah it's not i mean what we are seeing today it's it's just the backbone of it or rather the where it all comes from is from the economic slavery part yeah it has uh, driven us to be really um slaves in a way and slavery is not just about how we learned in the history but now even the life that we live today so for us to be independent and for us to uh, focus on ourselves is to believe in ourselves and what that's what the former president said we can so everyone in our own capacity we can we we don't have to be very dependent yeah so as we read and just to echo what uh, the guest of honor said it's not about launching the book but how will the book will help each and every one of us in our own capacity to pick up something and be able to use it in our own lifestyle and be able to bring change that our fallen hero wanted us to have uh, ladies and gentlemen i would like again to welcome professor mapunda who will in turn welcome our author to give a speech Thank you once again MC uh, the guest of honor now I have the pleasure to welcome professor Malango to the podium but before I do that uh, 
as a scholar, I have uh, a few words of admiration that I need to utter. Uh, Professor Malangu, yeah, it is uh, not only the content of your book that uh, makes some of us who are in the uh, profession of academia uh, admire you, but the effort that you put into it. We are aware of the kind of uh, labor that goes into writing. There are people who completed PhD maybe in 1960, and they have remained so uh, to the present, not publishing a single article to enable them to move even from lectureship to uh, senior lectureship, leave alone professorship. So uh, I wanted to uh, submit my appreciation of your scholarliness in this aspect as being able to write a book which one of the readers has correctly said is actually fact-based and research-based and not just statements as uh, some people would like to put sometimes. Uh, this is research-based and you say yourself in the book that uh, you have spent five, six years collecting information and so that is not easy and people in academia to do this. And as I said at the beginning, the, the reason why South, as a university, decided to make this an important event, you had a launch in Mwanza and a second one here in Dar es Salaam. One of the encouragement that we have, not only of the content about slavery, economic slavery, that the youth should take it uh, and leave it. But also for the young academics to know that to become a professor, as the guest of honor was saying, is not just a matter of claiming that I want to be a professor. No, we want you to prove that you are. And indeed, you have proven to us that indeed. Uh, University of Hebron didn't make a mistake to make you a professor and now I have the honor to invite you to come and tell us. Thank you. Habari uh, ya Johnny <laughs> It's like that <laughs> Habari ya Johnny Asante sana I may not challenge you to continue I'm still a toddler in learning Kiswahili But I do believe that in three months time I'll be as much competent as you. I think I'll be as much eloquent yeah, as you. Yeah, that's the present mission. Our guest of honor, your lordship, Stephen Musomba, the auxiliary bishop,
our principal, Professor Mapunda, our uh, VC for South, Professor Costa Rica Mahalo, Mr. Sabato Nyamsenda from the University of Dar es Salaam, representing the School of Political Science and Public Administration. Mr. Matthews Kabadi, our renowned writer, who was with us in Mwanza, and so glad to also see him here. Professor Matambaria, the friend of South. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Our uh, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I would like to thank you for the warmest welcome that I've ever had. This is quite remarkable. It, of course, going to my diary as one of the greatest events that I've ever recorded. The case of honor, allow me in a special way to thank Professor Costa Rica Mahalo and his South team for a commendable job that has been done to make this event possible. As Brother Nyamsenda said, he prayed the best tricks to make sure that he hijacks his, this uh, event. He competent, I mean, competently did it, and we appreciate uh, Professor Maharu's law and the team for being such versatile. And at the same time, we'd like to thank the University of Dar es Salaam for the support that you have shown throughout this project, especially towards this launch. Mr. Myasenda was correct and completely right when he was mentioning it that we've been in touch again and again. We've been in touch through whichever means, phone calls, text, name them and call them. All in all, the support has been massive. If I'm to mention one by one, time may not allow us. But I should accept the fact and acknowledge it that the Tanzanians have actually shown that you are brothers, you are our real brothers. Coming to this side is because your brotherly act that you have shown. In absentia, allow me to thank Madam Agufuri for the massive support that she has also put, especially the moral support. Yesterday, I, had, I, I received a call for a visitation whereby I had to go to her residence. It was extremely awesome. Of course, maybe I don't have to preempt I'm going to uh, push it at some point as I'm moving on. But at this point in time, I just want to acknowledge her support in the process. The guest of honor, it is always hard, especially to come and talk when the best speakers have done their role. 
And more specifically, when you are even shorter, you have to make sure that you make your voice taller at some point. I would like to thank you, my colleagues, for splendid presentations, eloquent presentations. When I was coming, I was trying to, I was debating in between making a presentation and then just a mere speech or else just a mere talk until when I was leaving my seat, coming to this place, I said, okay, let me just get on the podium. We'll see what it's going to be like. It's always an expectation from the audience. They'd like to hear what the author is going to say. And the author is always at the happiest moment to have the occasion, the event done. So to have the audience expectations and then the author, author's you know, expectations meeting is one of the greatest challenge. But one thing that I'd like to assure you is that I am the happiest. In most cases, we tend maybe to stammer just because we have that exceeding joy which we can't, you know, maybe express it through the word of mouth. However, the greatest challenge for the audience is that they would like to hear more about the author. What is it? Well, what, you know, inspired, what made, you know, what made the author to come up with a publication? So, the case of honor, uh, my speech will be different, will be divided into two parts. The first one, I'm going to talk about the, the technical aspect of the book, the uh, publication itself. The book project was started in 2017. So in 2017, that's when I started the book project, and it got completed in 2023. Uh, so basically, it has taken me about six years to complete the book. We corrected data using various means. For example, we used uh, desk research to correct the data. We used observation, and we also used interviews to correct data. So somewhere around 2019, 2020, I had to visit Tanzania several times just to make sure that I correct the data. I remember visiting Zanzibar for some weeks just to make sure that I have actionable data and visiting Dar es Salaam for some weeks as well just to make sure that the data is accurate. I also had to visit various countries, uh, to, apart from Tanzania, to correct data. Yeah, for example, I had to visit Zambia, Zimbabwe, Kenya, RSA. I had to visit India, I had to visit Qatar, I had to visit United Arab Emirates, just to make sure that the strategies we are presenting are well round and also well benchmarked with the other economies as well. The guest of honor, in terms of referencing, the book has used the Harvard referencing system, and it has 252 in-text referenced uh, citations, and the book has acknowledged 50 websites. The preliminary part, the reference section and the main chapters are adding up to 500 pages. Initially, we produced the book in a way that it gave us 800 pages. Then when we came up with the 800 page layout, somebody intimidated us. Hey, Prof, you're coming up with a publication that has 800 pages. Who do you think is going to read your 800 in document? You're going to read your, by yourself. And then I said, okay, fine. Then we're going to play some uh, mathematics. So what we did was to increase the size of the book so that the pages are fewer, right? Yeah, for, the, for those that are in, let's say, in the medical area, or those that are clinicians, clinicians they understand what they call the placebo effect. Yeah, the placebo effect is a kind of a thing whereby you say, no, doctor, I don't get along with tablets, I prefer injections. So they're going to change it in one way or another, but they say medication right and then when it 
they inject you, they say, now you must feel better. I said, yes, I'm feeling better. But the same, you know, generic uh, drug, right? Yeah, there are placebo effect. So this time around, we have 500 pages so that at least it's, it's not intimidating. Uh, just the way you can um, look, look, look at it is somehow portable. But that time it was uh, something else. So this time around, uh, you can easily digest it uh, at some point just because we increased the book size. The book has five parts, five components. And as a matter of fact, it has 48 chapters. Out of the 48 chapters, 13 chapters have put Magufuli in context. 13 chapters have put Magufuli in context. So uh, the first part of the book is called The Footprints of Slavery, which as correctly as um, uh, the Lordship has put it, we need to learn from the past because the past, that's where we learn from. And the present is here for us to manage and the future is there for us to create it. So the past is very critical. So we are taking Africa from the time of slavery. So we are actually seeing the footprints of slavery. On that part, the author had to visit several sites. Yeah, for example, Emina Castle in Ghana, just to appreciate what the atrocities of slavery were like. And in 2019, the author had to come to Zanzibar and he actually got into the underground chambers for some time just to test how the slaves were feeling. It was a very awkward situation, a very awkward experience. It is very hard for you to go to Zanzibar, especially in the underground slave chamber, and then you come out without you know, shedding tears. Uh, it's very hard. And it's very difficult for you to come out of the chamber, and then you move on. You quickly go for Ugali. It's very you know, difficult. Why? Because of the situation in the uh, slave chambers. Yeah, so let's say on this part, the author has come up with some chapters. Chapters like, yeah, uh, chapters like, uh, chapter one, show me the Elmina Castle, not the Windsor Castle. Show me the Elmina Castle, not the Windsor Castle. I think it's very soon that we actually saw our heads of state flying to, uh, let's say, Europe, to bury the queen, isn't it? Right? Yeah, fine. So anyway, in Europe, that's where we have you know, the Windsor Castle in England. Right? But the author is saying, I don't want to go to Windsor Castle. Show me the Elmina Castle. Because that's where I'm going to see the atrocities that's, that our fathers and, you know, it's like mothers were facing. Our sons and brothers, you know, were facing. And from there, that's where we start, you know, questioning the answers that the Western has you know given us the chapters could continue from uh, chapter one went to chapter two uh, which is uh tear drops in zanzibar because in zanzibar had to go to the underground chamber you know cry because of the atrocities that i was you know i could experience in chapter four it's talking about freed but caged freed but caged Neocoronialism. After slavery, they let us, you know, free at some point, but they tied us to a chain so that we are still, you know, caged. So we are still caged even until now. And chapter five, Lincoln yet to rest in peace. Abraham Lincoln is not sleeping in peace just because his wish is still not made at some point. So we have part two, which is talking about Africa a panoramic view of the key challenges. Africa, a panoramic view of the key challenges. So let's talk about rest in peace, Yaguine Koita. It's a sad story if you actually uh, go through it. Um, and we have chapter, let's say, seven, development crisis in Africa. Chapter eight, rich Africa and poor Africans. And then chapter nine, tribalism and nepotism, the killer dragons of development in Africa. Among us, the countries that I've actually traveled, I've seen that tribalism is something that is stagnating the development of Africa. 
You go to Zambia, the case is the same. You go to Nigeria, the song is the same. You go to Malawi, the song is the same. You come this side, you also find tribalism in, you know, some dimensions. So, tribalism, a killer, you know, dragon. And then chapter 10, the donor dependency, a killer insulin for Africa's diabetic economic condition. And chapter 11, Socrates, others call, uh, pronounce it as Socrates. Yeah, Socrates, proven right in Africa. This is the time, or this is a chapter whereby the author has put a lot of arguments as of, you know, the effectiveness of our democracy in Africa. The author has actually argued the quality of the vote, right? Whilst, you know, we look at the content of the vote, but the quality of the vote matters more. So the authors actually, you know, argued that, come on, we need to take a look at this. It's not just about, you know, how many have voted, but we also look at what's the quality of the vote. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make any sense to count a vote from somebody else who doesn't even know how to write, who doesn't even know what the manifesto is about. It maybe it doesn't make any sense at some point. So we need to take a look at that. Yeah, and then we have part three, which is talking about, which is putting Magufuli in context. Magufuli, a practical model for economic and leadership excellency. So uh, this part has brought some very good chapters in context. For example, uh, chapter 12, a shining star in the darkness of neocolonialism. Chapter 13, Heineken in Parliament. Heineken in Parliament. Uh, chapter 14, I'm um, chapter 14, uh, chapter 13, Heineken in Parliament. Chapter 14, a tete a tete with Kenyatta. Chapter 15, missing in Manhattan. Chapter 16, Magufuli's business prowess. Uh, 17, thriving bureaucracy. Uh, then 18, Magufuli's um, tears on corruption. And 19, the economic development uh, superstar. Chapter 20, the common good gravitas. Chapter 21, the immortal Magufuli. And then part four, the book has articulated the change that Africa needs. So on this part, uh, the author is also trying to be practical, bringing a fun topic like uh, chapter 22, take me to the Mosi Watunya, not the Buju Khalifa. Take me to the Mosi Watunya, not the Buju Khalifa. Whilst correcting data, I had to go to the Buju Khalifa, uh, which is the United Arab Emirates. So the author was very delighted, was very uh, interested, felt just so good to actually see the tallest building in the world. So he was very happy to say, wow, I've seen the tallest building in the world. I'm so happy I've been to the tallest building in the world, the Burj Khalifa. Some few years, uh, about uh, some few months later, I went to the uh, Victoria Falls. And then whilst at the Victoria Falls, I saw the most amazing message that I've never, you know, seen. It was actually on the statue of Dr. David Livingstone. It was written, this is the most beautiful place that I've ever seen in England. Much more beautiful that even angels would stop for a minute and gaze. And then I said, wow, come on. We thought that the most beautiful place is the Burj Khalifa. But now look what David Livingstone is saying. The most beautiful place is the Bosi Watunya. Then I said, come on, let me call this chapter. Take me to the Bosi Watunya, not the Buju Khalifa. Paul Kagama said, we don't need to go out to find African solutions. The African solutions are here. So many times I've actually, you know, gone out of the country. I mean, gone out of Africa thinking that African solutions will actually come there. But this chapter, we are saying that the solutions are right here. So uh, the author has tried to put that into context. Chapter 23, the author has argued with a lot of energy, the magnification of Africa, total systems overhaul for development. The author has presented a case whereby he's arguing that the problem of Africa is lack of systems because africa is still operating using the colonial systems we are still operating using the colonial system so we have some serious problems so this has something to do with our education something to do with our uh, operational systems 
yesterday public sector you know systems yeah, so our systems are extremely ancient so we need to overhaul them so the slave masters have left but the systems are the same so these are the systems that are tying us so the magnification of africa is demanding a lot so because of lack of systems that's why we always cry that wow that former president is gone so who will be next we get worried because we don't have you know the systems if the systems are solid you don't worry so much because the systems are the ones which are in control the systems so we need to overhaul the systems because some of the systems the systems that we are using we are using right now they are actually designated to benefit the colonizer we have chapter 24 which is governance uh, re-engineering and then we have chapter 25 rebranding africa's universities for global competitiveness rebranding africa's universities for global competitiveness uh, we are, the author has actually put in context uh, uh, um, Oxford University, the likes of Professor Pollard, who took advantage of the COVID, COVID pandemic, and they actually showcased that we are university. This is what a university is supposed to do. Whilst Africa, Africa's universities, we are sleeping. They didn't even think of, you know, coming up with a vaccine. That is even of a, maybe a 5% efficacy just to show up that we've been there or we are there so replanting africa's university there are so many things that we need to do just to make sure that we are also on the page yeah 26 the bismarck's idealism 27 one chucking africa 28 leadership sankaraism the authors put sankara in context because during the magufuli studies we have seen that sankara and magufuli had some common traits so we have put them in context um, chapter 30, demolishing the political chameleons. Chapter 33, speeding for Africa's development. We have put the slave trade in context. Whilst uh, we are busy with the slave, uh, being slave uh, traded, our friends we are developing in so many you know, ways. So we need to speed up for development. Uh, chapter, the, the, final chapter, the final part, uh, which is uh, creating a new Africa has suggested the strategies that Africa has to do. In one of the areas, one of the chapters which is core is cracking the black box. Cracking the black box. As you are going through the book, you are going to enjoy it and then see what it is demanded. The black box. The black box. This is the information that the governments, the politicians are trying to protect so that you don't access. The, the black box, the information, the public information that you deserve to know. And this is the breeding ground for corruption because you don't know the black box. So the politicians who kind of, you know, are put in, in their, let's say, campaigns. We are going to have the access to information bill, access to information bill, operationalized. Now, when the moment they get in power, they stay quiet. Why? Because they know that the moment the citizens have access to the information that is the time that corruption is going to end completely and this is why Bacon said at one point knowledge is power he didn't have, he didn't mean it was like uh, having a phd or professorship but he didn't he simply meant being able to access the information that you know the uh guest of honor one of the questions which i got when i was writing the book was that uh, what is it that has motivated you to write this book what is it that has motivated you to write this book and then i said a song a song is what motivated me to write this book i would like to just take 30 seconds of your minute or, or, of your time so that you listen to the song that made me to think of writing this book just a second of your time I'm mean, 30 seconds of your time
was a cry of the sons and daughters in the slave chambers of Emina Castle. And they were singing that song, Sense and Ina, what have we done to deserve this torture? What have we done to deserve this torture? And then the most touching sight was the moment when they are saying, we shall meet in heaven, Soshangana Ezulini. That was the time when they were saying bye. They were passing what is called, or what was called, the door of no return. That was the point when a slave was called, John. So John had to rise up, knowing that this is the last time for me to see my friends. I will never see them anymore because I'm now taking a trickless journey to the plantations of America. So he had to wave, guy, bye-bye, bye-bye, uh, we will never meet again. We shall meet in heaven if possible. That was the message, that was the song by the slave. Uh, by this by this former slave some years way back now in 1863 Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation a declaration which was made to set the slave free the guest of honor is now about 160 years that has erupted or that have erupted since the um, signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. However, 160 years later, the Africans are still not free. The Africans are still economic slaves. 160 years later, Africans are still having very poor roads. Africans are still having no access to portable water. 160 years later, Africans are still living in misery. 160 years later, the corruption fiesta is still the tradition of politicians and technocrats in African governments. And 160 years later, the common mayor, man, the common person has been deprived of his or her amenities. 160 years later, a common African is still not free. This is what made me to come up with a book called Africa, Magufuli and Change. So that by communicating, by imparting what is in the book, we can have a sense of direction that we should take in order to be so free. The other question which I got when I was writing the book was that why have you chosen Magufuli? Why have you chosen Magufuli? out of all the presidents in Africa. Why is it that you have chosen Magufuli? And out of all the presidents in Tanzania, why is it that you have chosen Magufuli? The guest of honor, to answer this question, I would like to ask you to be with me in this journey. And then let's go to Chato. So as we are going to Chato, let's interact with the people. And by and by, let us hear what they are actually saying. And many of them, they are communicating that Magufuli was our hero. Magufuli was so caring. Magufuli was somebody else whom we could say sent from God. I was privileged to visit Magufuli's Chato Musorium. When I got into the Musorium, I was touched. And as I was standing, while I was facing the head of his tomb, I wish I had the powers to resurrect people. The guest of honor, I wish I was a Jesus Christ or the Jesus Christ so that I could shout, John, arise and show the people how it is possible to face corruption dauntlessly so that the common people benefit. I would say, John, rise up and show African leaders 
how you made it to stay in your tenure without visiting Europe and America. John, rise up. Show us how you put us development in Tanzania. John, rise up. I really desired having the power to resurrect, but I really lamented having none. The guest of honor, we are in a situation whereby we want to change. Everybody would like to see Africa changing. So many authors have written about books that can drive Africa into economic rebellion. But we lack the power to implement what we have written. How would I have liked John to rise up so that he should receive his flowers by himself. Flowers from Chateau, flowers from St. Grema, flowers from Gaeta, flowers from Manyala, flowers from Dar es Salaam, flowers from Zanzibar. But I had to accept a reality that death has really robbed us. The one who was determined to put Tanzania and Africa in the right direction. I know some of you might be much more interested still to say, come on, you are a Marawian, but how come that you are still much more interested with Magofoli? Now let me reveal, reveal the secret to you. When we saw Magofoli, we actually saw a bulldozer whom we knew that is going to put our leaders under pressure. Pressure that, look, your friend in Tanzania is performing, so you have to do likewise. So we know that he's a very good president. And when he died, we even wept more because we knew that our president has been lost. The book is finishing with In Search of a New Magufuli. We acknowledge a fact that Magufuli has passed on. And it is very unlikely that we can have him now because he's in chat. But we can emulate whatever, you know, he did. This book has put or has named Magufuli, or has called Magufuli different names in various uh, chapters. And those are the attributes, those are the qualities that we are looking for. And the new Magufulis have to be us. The new Magufulis have to be our readers at that very top level. We need to be the new Magufulis. So the book has actually called Magufuli in various, uh, I mean, has given Magufuli various names. For example, a chapter, 20, a chapter 12 is calling Magufuli a, 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 a star, a shining star in the darkness of neocolonialism. And chapter 13 is calling Magufuli as the no nonsense deontologist. Chapter 14 is calling Magufuli as an intelligent listener. Chapter 15 is calling Magufuli a true patriot. Chapter 16 is calling Magufuli a business genius. Chapter 17 is calling Magufuli a challenger of bureaucracies. In chapter 18 is calling Magufuli a scorpion to the corrupt. Magufuli challenged the Tanzanians. I want you Tanzanians to believe that you have a president, a real rock. I cannot be threatened, and I am not threatened. Of course, he was a real rock. Of course, I may call him East Africa's rock of ages. In chapter 9... If you find yourself in a TV rut, add entertainment to the max. This